want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. How to get out of a rut. I know that you're better than I am, and so you've never been in a rut. But I've been in several ruts in my life. I think recently I've been in a rut. I may be in a rut right now. But uh, I'll tell you something. It's, it's something I think that a lot of Christians can identify with. It is so easy sometimes to just go with the flow. And the, and the flow seems to be the same flow and the same flow, the same thing, the, 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 over and over and over and over. And we wonder sometimes, man, nothing seems to be changing. Nothing seems to be changing. And you know, that's called a rut. And sometimes ruts can be so depressing and so discouraging. Because oftentimes when we're in the rut, we might not even recognize we're in it. And sometimes when you're in the rut, you, you can't see what the problem might be. You're just there and you're wondering, man, how long is this going to go on? First Peter chapter number 5, beginning verse number 5, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make ye perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Father in heaven, bless us now, and bless your word to us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. In Nottingham, England, there was a, a sign on a, on a, a coat store, and uh, and it said on the sign, and I'll read it, I quote, We have been established for over 100 years <laughs> and have been pleasing the disple- and displeasing customers ever since. We have made money and lost money, suffered the effects of coal naturalization, coal rationing, government control, and bad payers. We have been cussed and disgust." Messed about, lied to, held up, robbed, and swindled. And yet that store owner declared that in spite of life's difficulties, we're still here. We're still here. You know, Psalm 73, the psalmist reminded us, this is very, very well-known psalm. Psalm 73, verse 2 and 3, it says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My foot had, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then drop down to verse 17 of that very same chapter. All of a sudden, God got through. And he said, until I went into the sanctuary of God, And what do you hear when you go in the sanctuary of God, but you hear God's word? Went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. You know, I know people all over the world, they think that they're getting away with their wickedness, they're not getting away with anything. Because nobody gets out of here without facing God. And they'll face God. And that's what the psalmist was saying. Then understood I their end. You know, all the things that they did that maybe uh, were just absolutely wrong, but they prospered doing it, it's not going to be worth it when they have to spend eternity in a Christless hell begging for mercy and mercy will never come. Christians have... uh, uh, a better reason to endure 
And, and in some cases, let's face it, let's not, let's not feel too sorry for ourselves, but times have gotten tougher in America. If someone asked, are you better now than you were two years ago? Uh, only an imbecile would say, no, I'm better today than I was two years ago. Well, the truth of the matter is, though, as tough as things may be, we, we're still living fat on the hog compared to the rest of the world. But nonetheless, the Lord has assured us in His Word that better times are ahead. Better times are ahead. Heaven's right around the corner, I think. And even if I live to be a hundred years old, that's still around the corner. And, uh, and then it's heaven for eternity. The psalmist, he reminded us, didn't he, that even though the wicked may seem to be winning, they're not really winning. Uh, they may be temporarily vindicating themselves. But in the end, it will be the righteous that will be vindicated. And the wicked shall be condemned. It's in times like now that we're going to that if you're not careful, you can get into a rut. Same old, same old. Even in church, same old, same old. I come, but it doesn't seem like anything's happening. It doesn't seem like God's Word is, is doing in me what maybe God's Word is supposed to be doing in me. What's wrong? And some people think, well, I better change churches. I better change geography and live somewhere else. Maybe I better get another job or another spouse. Or maybe I better do, you know, do something. When, when the problem is none of those things, the problem is us. The problem is us. I don't know if you could say amen to this, but do you ever feel like you get in a rut? Do you ever feel that way? Well, there's some things that God tells us to do right here in 1 Peter chapter 5. The first one is surrender your will to God. You have a will, I have a will. We have those things that we desire. But you know, we probably in all likelihood didn't discuss any or very few of those things ever with God. In 1 Peter 5, look at verse 5 and 6 again. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Why? Because they're wiser. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you, not in our time, but in due time. We live in a day when people are all seeking their own way. They're doing their own thing, aren't they? I mean, we're hearing it every day. And it's, and it's nauseating, in some cases, to hear what in the world's going on. But it's no different than it was in the time of the judges. Judges 17.6. The Bible says every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Well, the reason why is because the beginning of that verse says there was no king. In other words, there was no authority in the land. And when there was no authority in the land, the people became lawless. I'm not the first one who has declared, publicly even, that our judicial system is broken. It is totally and utterly broken. And those that are breaking it are, are absolutely bent on the destruction of the Constitution of the United States of America. But may I remind you of something a professor, my, one of my professors reminded me of many years ago. He said, never forget, the Constitution of the United States of America is not the Bible. It's not the Bible. The same crowd that wants to destroy the Constitution is the same crowd that wants to destroy this book. They want to destroy it. And there's any number of ways that they're attempting to destroy that. But because there's no authority, because there's no respect for authority, because law enforcement is, uh, is, is looked upon as being the enemy, and in some cases, uh, as we're finding out with the highest echelons of, of law enforcement, the, 
the, the Department of Justice, the FBI, uh, the CIA, we're finding that these agencies that are at the very pinnacle of law enforcement supposedly are actually the entities that are working against the American people. That doesn't mean everybody that works for them is. But it means that there are people in high places. And isn't that what God says? For we battle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. High places like the Pentagon. High places like the White House. High places like the Department of Justice. High places like the, like the FBI, the CIA. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm in trouble. This goes out over, uh, over, uh, why, oh, over a live stream. doesn't matter to me. Because the truth is the truth. Amen. And because there's no respect for authority, parents have lost control of their children. Schools have now said they're not your children, they're our children. States have come out and said, if you don't allow, I mean, I'm serious when I tell you right now, there are states that are putting forth legislation, a laws on the book, put laws on the book, that if parents get in the way of their kids' desire to uh, change their gender identity, the state will move in and take those kids away from the parents. No authority. For the child of God, however, if we want to please the Lord, we must learn. We have to learn right now. You want to get out of the rut? We have to learn right now that God must be the authority of your life. That you and I don't get the right to do anything without that we first bowed our heart and said, God, what do you think about this? We must have God first place in our life. First place. I'm sorry, wifey poo, you're not first place. You're a very important place. You really are. But if you want a husband that's worth having, you better pray that your husband will keep God first place in his life. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 it says, and he is the head of the body, the church. What is the body? The body of Christ? It's called the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And so 1 Peter chapter 5, it gives us a phrase, clothed in humility. Literally, it means to put on the apron of a slave. And, and this is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus pictured this when he washed the feet of the disciples. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 6, the, the Bible says uh, that we are to serve the Lord this way. And how do we serve him? Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. It's not doing something for the Lord when somebody is watching. It's not doing something for the Lord that way, but serving the Lord from your heart when no one is watching. But God is watching. And then you see the word servants. Somehow we don't like that. Somehow this woke generation would say that's racist. Well, they can say whatever they want. It's in the Bible. It'll be in the Bible, by the way, long after they're dead and gone. Right. The word servants is where we get the idea of humility. To be a servant, you have to be humble. You have to be humble. You see, there's no surrender without humility. If we can learn the way of humility, then the Lord will lift us out in His time he will lift us right out of whatever rut we might find ourselves in. If we seek to promote ourselves, however, if we seek to try to exalt ourselves with, without giving any regard to the glory of God, we will never amount to much for the glory of God. We'll, we'll live and we will die and we will not have brought much glory, if any glory. To God whatsoever. So to get out of the rut, we have to, first of all, we have to surrender our will. We have a will. But is, but is your will my will? Is that God's will? And have we even bothered to find out? And secondly, 
We need to put our worry on God, don't we? Oh, Gary Randall, I hope you get this point. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I don't know how many times I've read that passage. Casting means to throw. It means to, it means to throw our burdens on Jesus. All the worries. Everything. When they press us down. And it's easy to do, oh pastor, I wish I could be like you. Because you never have anything bother you. You haven't got the foggiest clue. I know what this verse says. And I'll give it over to the Lord. I think I was talking to Brother Chris earlier today. Yeah, I give some things over to the Lord. And then before my, pill, my head hits the pillow, I've already taken half a dozen of them back. The worries press us down. But we don't have to bear those worries. We don't, we don't have to bear those worries alone at least. We can give them over to God. God's stronger than we are. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, and 30. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Think about that. I mean, our Savior was meek and lowly. That means he was powerful, but he was also lowly. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. It wasn't rest for your muscles. It was rest for your souls. And that's, that's oftentimes where Christians need the most rest is right there. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And how much of the burden should we give to the Lord? Well, it says casting all your care. All your care, everything. At Florence Baptist when I was there, uh, Pastor Lowen, I had a lady, if I called her name, you'd remember her. She came into the office, and she had a real troubled look on her face. And, uh, and I, I happened to be there when she came in, and I called her by name, and I said, I said, you look like you're troubled about something. She said, oh, Pastor, I really am. I said, well, tell me what it is. She said, I've misplaced my keys. Now, how many have ever misplaced their keys? Raise your hand just so the rest of us can feel good about the fact that we misplaced our keys too. But she was very troubled about that. And I said, well, and I called her by name, and I said, well, have you, have you prayed about this? And she said, she looked at me like, and, and she was an elderly lady, and she looked at me like any grandma would look at an uh, impotent grandchild that didn't, didn't know too much, and she'd say, oh, pastor. I'm not going to bother God with these little things. And I, I, that stuck with me. And I thought, wait a minute. There are no little things with God. Everything is an important thing. And, uh, and so we, we cast all our care. We're not supposed to keep the smallest thing, not even your keys. Now some of you right now are praying and saying, God, I need to find those keys. Or whatever it might be. And you thought to yourself, this is so teeny tiny, God doesn't need to be bothered with this. Well, God's not bothered by anything. God will be, God will be blessed if you would cast all your care and me too. And how do we do this? We do this with the faith that God absolutely cares for us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God absolutely cares for you? Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. All of the infirmities, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what those infirmities might be. Sometimes we think those are physical. It's more than physical. It's whatever you're going through in life can be an infirmity. And God's been touched by that. He's touched by that. Our burdens touch the heart of God. And He's moved. He's moved on our behalf when He sees that there's something going on in our life. 
And he's waiting to hear from us. He's waiting for us to cry out to him and say, Father, I need you. So to get out of the rut, that's something we've got to do. We have to surrender our will. God, I want to do your will. Are you afraid to pray that? Are, are you willing to pray and say, God, uh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that I'm in your will. I'm not so sure that my life is the fulfillment of your will for why you even put me on this planet in the first place. But I'm not afraid to pray, God, that I want your will done in my life and not my own. And you know what? When we get down to business with God, sometimes it's then that God gets down to business with us. And then we have to put our worry on God. We can't carry it around. There's nothing, listen, there's, there's, there's nothing noble about carrying the burden. In fact, if, if we're going to just get down to the meat of the potatoes, it's stupid, isn't it? It's stupid for me to do it. Oh, I've fretted about all kinds of things. I've got to tell you, in the last two years, I've fretted more than the last two years, and I've fretted probably any other time in my Christian existence. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that to, to uh, try to give anybody an excuse here, because there's no excuse for me. I've had to learn along the way, you know, God, forgive me. Here I am worrying about it again. Lord, please take this. And however many times we have to surrender our will to God's will, and however many times we've got to cast that burden on God, then do it. If it's 10 times a day, then do it. If it's 50 times a day, then do it. If it's 100 times a day, then do it. Pretty soon it'll get so habitual that we do it that pretty soon that's what we're doing. And then thirdly, we need to seriously walk with God. Too much of Christendom is about lip service. I'm so glad to see you out. You know, I think that this is probably the most important service in the whole week. I do believe that. Christians need to wake up and start seriously walking with God. In chapter 5 of 1 Peter, verse 8 and 9, look at, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist and fast in the faith, not in your own strength. Notice that. He didn't say in your power. He said in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We're told that we need to be sober and vigilant. That means sober doesn't mean uh, uh, throw away the booze bottle, although throw away the booze bottle because you don't need to be drunken either. Be sober, be vigilant means to be serious and aware of what's happening around you. Suppose one of the, one of the security guys ran in here tonight and said, Everybody, everybody stay in place. Man, we've got a mountain lion. We've got a huge mountain lion that's right outside the doors of this church. You would be a fool to go outside. You would be a fool to go outside. Because that mountain lion will kill you. A lion, a lion God says, uh, is, is the devil. Who do you think wants to get your life messed up and in a rut anyway? It's the devil. God doesn't want that. Who do you think is actively interested in making your Christian life miserable? It's not God. It's the devil. Who do you think is working against you every single day of your life? Messing up your family. Messing up your marriage. Messing up everything. Who do you think is doing that? God? No. It's the devil. Most of the world doesn't even believe in the devil. Oh, I saw the devil once on a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Little red, little red devil suit. Little pointy tail. Little pitchfork. The world mocks at the thought of the devil. 
Well, just in case there's any confusion in your mind tonight about that, Jesus believes in the devil. The devil exists. And he's warning us about him. The devil's compared to a roaring lion, not just a lion. A roaring lion. There's a lot of similarities between the devil and lions. You know that? Lions are, number one, they're forceful. I didn't know this. The lions are 21 times more powerful than the strongest human being. Satan is far stronger than any of us could ever tackle physically. Jesus told Peter, Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. Well, you know something, beloved? We can't fight the devil on our own. Again, we don't battle flesh and blood. We battle spiritual wickedness, and the Bible tells us what our spiritual uh, armament is and what our spiritual weapons are. Even Michael the archangel, who we would never want to mess with, by the way, even he wouldn't fight the devil. Jude, chapter, Jude uh, verse 9 tells us, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, Moses durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. It wasn't Michael rebuke thee. Michael rebuke thee wouldn't have done anything. But the Lord rebuke thee. That puts the devil in his place. Well, not only are devils forceful, they're ferocious. Absolutely ferocious. And, uh, and those who encounter lions, wherever they might find a mountain lion, uh, I'll tell you something, I, I know a man in Montana that he doesn't do it now, but he used to hunt mountain lions for a living. He said, you don't mess with mountain lions. <laughs> mountain lions are cold-blooded killers. They will kill you when their belly is full. And that's the way it is. They're ferocious. God's children don't need to fear the devil, however. 1 John 4 and verse 4, isn't this a great verse? Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You see, as long as we stay in the spiritual battle... We don't have anything to fear from the devil. Lions are also fearful. You see, they say, and I'm glad I haven't been around, well, I've been to the zoo. I've been in a cat... <laughs> this sounds horrible. I've been in a cat house. <laughs> well, that's what they're called. They're, 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 they're you know, the, the feline uh, display or something. Uh, the one I was in up in Seattle was called a cat house. And it was feeding time when we were in there. And a couple of those big lions started roaring, and I mean you could feel it in your chest. It was unreal. Well, they say that a lion's roar can be heard five miles away. I'm not going to measure it out to see. I didn't know this either, that, my, that lions do most of their roaring at night so that they can put terror in, the prayer, in, the, in, their, in their prey. And that's what the devil does for us. Do you know that sometimes the worst times that Christians have are at night? Battling what the devil's trying to do with your thought life. You're trying to pray. You ever try to pray, Christian, and it seems like you can't get your thoughts together? You ever try to pray, Christian, and you're just all over the place, and then, and then somehow the most wicked thought that you ever could think all of a sudden comes in your mind. Where do you think that came from? That came from the lion. Fear paralyzes faith. A lot of, lot, of, lot of Christians are living in fear today. If they, if they put as much energy into faith as they did into fear, 
their lives would have been completely changed. If the devil can paralyze my faith and your faith with fear, then he can attack any place in our life and be victorious. And the good news is, the good news is that the devil can be defeated by any child of God. Any child of God. All we need to do is just submit ourselves, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That's point number one. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That means to stand up. Stand up. Be counted for something. Be steadfast, knowing the Lord's already defeated the devil. We already have the victory. Listen, it's not about, I hope we get to heaven. It's about we're going to heaven because Jesus already paid the way. Satan's already lost. So if he's Satan's already lost, then can I just can I just implore you tonight? And I know I'm preaching the choir tonight. But don't let the devil have your children. Don't let the devil have your children. Man, if that, if that means that you've got to leave your job and homeschool, then leave your job and homeschool. Downsize your living requirements. Get rid of the high-priced vehicles and get something with 150,000 miles on it that you can afford. Don't, don't sacrifice your children to the devil. Don't sacrifice your whole family to the devil. Don't do it. Don't do it. You know how many how many gray-haired people are 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 right now and I'm talking about Christians and I'm not putting down old folks, I'm one. But how many of them pillow their head at night wishing that their adult kids lived for God? But something went haywire. And they can't blame the church. And there's bad churches, there's no question. And some of those need to be blamed. But in most cases, it's because the Christian home was not what it's supposed to be. You and I can resist the devil. We can can stand in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and we can see him defeated in our life. We can get to the place where if we desire it and make a decision, we can seriously walk with the Lord. It's minute by minute. It's almost second by second. It's decision by decision. That's why I look out here tonight and I see this this good crowd of people. And I'm thinking, man, on a Thursday night, the weather looked like it was going to be totally inclement. And I wondered in myself when I put out the one call, I wonder how many are just going to let the rain keep them home. But you know something, beloved? We don't have to make decisions like that. We can thank God for the rain and buy an umbrella. Why not? Why not? I mean, if we needed snow boots in the winter, we'd go get snow boots for the winter, wouldn't we? But you know what? Uh, um, we, we need to seriously walk with the Lord. We need to decide, I'm going to read my Bible. We, we need to decide, I'm going to pray. Uh, we need to decide that we're going to do that. And the devil's going to fight you. And the devil's going to try to distract you. And the devil's going to try to put things in your way. And he's going to try to make your day busy. Is God going to be first? Is God going to be preeminent? We need to get serious about this. So to get out of the rut, we surrender our will to God, put our worry on God. We seriously walk with God, and then lastly, we wait on God to work. A lot of Christians give up because God didn't answer when they wanted God to answer. Verse 10 says, but the God of all grace, this verse is kind of hard to understand, so look at it closely who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, that's salvation, after that ye have suffered a while. You mean God's going to let us suffer a while? Uh Uh-huh. 
Yeah. Make you perfect. What is that? Perfect doesn't mean perfect like you and I think the English term means without sin. No. He's, he's talking make you mature. Establish. Strengthen. Settle you. How do you get to perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you? You get there by going through some stuff. The Lord's at work, even when we're not aware. Isaiah 40, 31, most Christians know, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Christian, can I remind all of us tonight that the Lord, nowhere in the Word of God, said that He would immediately lift every load, flatten out every mountain in your life, and smooth out every rough spot. He didn't say to immediately do that. He did say, I'm aware of it, and I'm touched by the feelings of your infirmities. But I'm going to let you suffer just a little while, he says, because suffering causes you to trust me more. Suffering causes you to be matured. Instead of being a childish Christian, you become a mature Christian. You become established in your walk. You become strengthened in your faith. And you are settled. In other words, you're not tossed to and fro by every single trend and garbage that comes down the pike. He did say that His grace was sufficient for anything that we face. 1 Corinthians 12, 9, And He said unto me, talking to the Apostle Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect, He's saying, in your physical weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory, Paul said, in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And even though the Apostle Paul couldn't have, couldn't have held his, a lick in the gymnasium of the world, he was a spiritual weightlifter. He knew exactly what it was to have the power of God on his life. When he talked to people, when he shared the gospel with people, those people fell under severe conviction, many of them, and got saved. God knew what he was doing, didn't he? We have in verse 10 the word suffer. We don't like suffering. Did you know if you look up your Bible concordance, you're going to find out that there's a ministry of suffering? Even Job knew that there would be difficult times, and Job was patient, <laughs> wasn't he? This verse tells us that when the suffering's over, I'm going to let you suffer a while. I don't know how long a while is, but I'm like you, beloved. I, I, I have to tell you, in my humanity, I don't want to suffer much. Do you? But I guess if I'm going to be what God wants me to be, then it's going to have to be His will, not my will. It's, it's definitely going to have to be God. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to give it to you. Pastor Dion, that, he was famous for this. I've never forgotten it all these years. When I was a youth pastor outside of Lincoln, Montana, the bus broke down. That's funny about our buses. We actually got some nice buses out there. And uh, that's funny. These independent fundamental Baptist buses are held together with barbed wire. Or not barbed wire, but, but bailing wire and and duct tape and bubble gum and and uh, and if there was only one rusted through spot on the floor, that was probably the good bus. I remember Pastor Dion. The bus broke down. When I was a youth pastor, the kids used to laugh about. It. In fact, the kids were disappointed if we ever went on a trip and, and made it all the way back and the bus didn't break down. So the bus broke down and there were no cell phones. We had to flag somebody down on the road and say, and write him a note and say, hey, would you please go call this person at this phone number and tell them where we're at and tell them to bring a bus out to pick up the kids because the bus broke down? Oh, sure, we'll do that. That's the way people were back then. 
And you know what? Uh, three hours go by, and all of a sudden, here comes rolling up another broken down bus. <laughs> Pastor Dion said this, I'll never forget. It. I'm wondering what in the world we're going to do. I mean, there's probably 30 young people here, and I'm the youth pastor, and I'm fretting around, and I'm doing everything that I, I how am I going to keep them busy? What do you do? You don't have any games on the bus. We, we, I didn't know what to do. I'm not going to start a campfire and burn down the whole, uh, the whole mountain outside of Lincoln, Montana. I wasn't going to do that either. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at Pastor Dion. I said, Pastor, I, I don't know. What should I do with these young people? He said, well, Gary, I don't know. He said, but uh, he said, uh, he, he, he said uh, no use God and I worrying about it. I'm going to bed. And he went in. He went, in the bed, he went in the bus and laid down on one of the back seats and went to sleep. I sure appreciated his help. <laughs> so, let me ask you something tonight. And then of an invitation. Are you surrendering your will to God? Do you know that that surrender is going to be a daily thing? The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. He said, I was dying to my will daily. He would get up and say, oh God, here's another day. I want you to guide and direct my day. I want you to be in control of my day. I want whatever I do in this day to be your will. And whatever isn't your will, I don't want to be doing. Let me ask you, are you putting your worries on God or are you carrying them around? Are they your worries? Or are you going to cast your care on God? Are you going to get serious about walking with God if you're not? Are you going to get serious about it? It's one thing to talk the talk. It's another thing to walk the talk. And then, if we do that, the rut will be gone. It will be gone. Because we'll see God at work. We'll see God at work in our lives. And that's what you and I want as Christians. That's what every single one of us that named the name of Christ, that's exactly what we want. There's people we want to see get saved, friends, neighbors, co-workers. There are, there are others that claim to be saved we want to, we want to grow. We want to grow. Every Christian wants to be a better Christian tomorrow. we've settled for the mediocre then I promise you right now you're in a rut so deep only God can get you out and this is how he, he this is a recipe this is exactly the recipe I have to follow that you have to follow that but invitation time always is a time when you and I can do business with God. When you and I can humble ourselves. Because that's part of it. Surrender is humble. Without humble, there is no surrender. And so we find our way to an altar. And we talk to the Lord. And we do business with God. And those things are right there. I want your will. I don't want this burden. I'm casting it on you. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you something, beloved. I mean, you know, if, if, if you and I would just take to heart these things and just practice them, we're not going to be perfect. I understand that. But when we recognize that something is, okay, that I, I need to take care of this, we take care of it. We take care of it. We don't let it linger. We do it God's way. God's way.